Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wonderful having you all here. Uh, this event on forest mathematics, unstable sets in indigenous Amazonia is organized by the Department of Anthropology and the Brazil Lab and co-sponsored by the Princeton Environmental Institute, the Program in Latin American Studies, and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Many thanks to, to Lisa Davis, co-organizer of the Anthropology uh, Colloquium Series, and to Patty Lieb and Carol Dobb for their wonderful help. Before introducing our terrific speaker, the Brazilian anthropologist Aparecida Vilaça, I want to say that this event is part of an ongoing collaboration between the Brazil Lab, the Departments of Anthropology, and Spanish and Portuguese, with the Social Anthropology Program of Brazil's Museu Nacional, where Aparecida Vilaça is a professor, one of Latin America's oldest and most important scientific and cultural institutions, which was tragically destroyed by fire a year and a half ago. With the great help of Princeton University Press and Firestone Library, we have been, ha been able here at Princeton to help a little bit with initial relief efforts, especially the reconstruction of the museum's anthropology library that was completely lost with the fire. And also with funds from the Provost Office and the Center for Human Values, uh, we are now organizing a series of academic initiatives between Princeton and the Museu Nacional's fantastic faculty and graduate students and postdocs aimed at intellectual cross-fertilization. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Aparecida Vilaça to Princeton, a professor at Brazil's Museu Nacional and a prolific researcher and luminous writer. Aparecida is currently a visiting professor at Stanford University. Aparecida studies sociocultural changes among indigenous peoples in Brazil with an emphasis on conversion to Christianity and schooling. She has carried out ethnographic research among the Vari people in southwestern Amazonia for over three decades. She's the author of many books, including Strange Enemies, Indigenous Agency, and Scenes of Encounters in Amazonia, Praying and Praying, Christianity in Indigenous Amazonia, Comendo Como Gente, Eating Like People, Forms of Vari Cannibalism, and co-editor of Native Christians, Modes and Effects of Christianity Among Indigenous Peoples of the Americas. Her most recent book, The Powerful Palito, I, eu, Palito and I, is a literary reflection on the life and passing of her Vari father. The Vari Indians wrote the amazing Mia Koto uh, in a blurb for the book, who are the focus of this narrative, carried firebrands with them wherever they traveled. The firebrands eternalize the memory and the presence of the other. This fire emerges in the form of the written word magisterially kindled by Aparecida Vilasa. Last week, Aparecida Vilasa was awarded one of the most prestigious books, book prizes in Latin America, the Casa de las Americas Book Prize for Brazilian Literature, and uh, for Palito Ineo. And we want to really congratulate you, Aparecida, for this incredible feat. The book, the citation uh, reads, addresses some of the most urgent problems of our times, such as the dialogue between cultures, the threat and knowledge of the forest, and the autonomy of indigenous communities. It is a heartfelt testament to Aparecida's profound ethical, moral, and political commitment to America's colonized peoples. Aparecida's current research focuses on science learning by the Vari children and young people, exploring the ambiguities produced in encounter between different ontologies, especially regarding the idea of nature. She's also co-editing with Geoffrey Lloyd the book, Science in the Forest, Science in the Past. It's also our great, great pleasure to have with us today Fernando Codam Marques, a fellow Brazilian. Fernando is a professor of mathematics here at Princeton. 
uh, Kodamarkis is interested in mathematical problems in the interface between geometry and analysis, and we thought quite appropriate they would have an anthropologist and a mat mathematician, <laughs> you know, in dialogue to get our conversation going today in the spirit of what we try to do in anthropology to queer a little bit how knowledge is produced, to have different perspectives coexisting, right? So, um, uh, Fernando is a winner of, of the Oswald Weblin Prize. He's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and a member of the Brazilian Academy of Science. And he will offer a few comments and a question of Sue or two after Aparecida's uh, talk. So, let's give Aparecida Vilaça and Fernando Codá Marques our warmest welcome. Well, thank you so much for this very, very kind uh, presentation. And for the invitation, I thank, of course, Pre Central University and the Brazil Lab and the Department of Anthropology, uh, and for Fernando to come here to, to comment on my paper. So uh, it's a, a big pleasure and honor to be here with you. So I'm going to read my paper. Uh, the title is a Forest Mathematics, Unstable Sets in Indigenous Amazonia. Mathematics in the Confrontation Zone. Much has been said about the culture shock resulting from interethnic contact, more specifically the contact between native and European peoples, which, among other things, generates humiliating situations for indigenous populations. Approaches to these confrontations tend to focus primarily on the religious sphere bodily and elementary practices, and kinship. It seems to me, though, that a central aspect of the conflicting views tends to pass unnoticed, namely mathematics. In the case of Amazonian peoples, this problem is especially relevant since they have become famous in both the anthropological and linguistic literatures for their poverty in numbers and consequently for their disinterest, translated by lay peoples and scholars alike as their difficulty in counting. While indigenous peoples obviously did not see the peculiarities of their numeric system uh, from the perspective of lack, the situation changed with the establishment of stable contact with white people who begin to impute them with a self-image of generalized poverty, including the strange idea of poverty in mathematical thought. On the side of the whites, the response to this observation was varied. Traders exploit the situation to profit from financial transactions, while teachers, many of them missionaries, took pity and decided to teach them numbers and counting along with the word of God. My objective in this paper is to bring mathematics, more specifically arithmetic, to the center of the discussion on the contact between indigenous and non-indigenous people in order to emphasize the peculiarities of, their former, of the former's mathematical thought. Moral calculations and the lack of numbers. A first characteristic that scholars of indigenous Amazonian mathematics emphasize is the inclusion of moral and relational questions in their calculations, a factor that becomes especially evident in the school context. The works of ethnomathematics, particularly those of Mariana Leal Ferreira among Amerindian peoples, show how such questions are often implicated in the ideally, precisely calculation of mathematics. Among the Chavante Indians of central Brazil, for example, where she worked as a teacher, the anthropologists witness the elaboration of mathematical problems fairly peculiar by the children, with answers equally unusual in the universe of arithmetic precision. The problems and their answers, both given by two children aged eight and nine, respectively, were as follows. 
Mm -hmm. My father is going to hunt paca. He has a box of cartridges. How many pacas will he kill? Answer, he will kill three or seven pacas, however many he manages to kill. Two, in my father's Sweden, there is a lot of maize. My mother is going to make maize cake. How many cakes will she make? Answer, she will make three very large cakes for everyone to eat. According to Ferreira, in both problems, and I quote, it's clear that there is no strict relationship between the quantity of maize cobs or rifle cartridges and the quantity of cakes made or pacas killed, respectively. The solutions to these problems involve other relations that are not included in the mathematical problems. The author, who also taught at uh, the Xingu Indigenous Park in the 1980s, gives us another interesting example. The problem given to the indigenous students was as follows. I caught 10 fish last night and gave three of them to my brother. How many fish do I have now? 13 came the answer. Observing the teacher's surprise, the student explained it to her that his calculation took into account the principles of the local exchange economy. And I quote, I ended up with 13 fish since whenever I give my brother anything, he pays me twice as much back. Therefore, 3 plus 3 equals 6. six uh, 10 plus 6 equals 16. And 16 minus 3, 13. At another occasion, a government employee who, having planned to buy from the Indians seven arrows at five cruzeiros each, became indignant by the aberrant amount eventually demanded for them. Where, and I quote him, where on earth does seven times five equal 125? You lazy Indians know nothing about money about buying and selling. It's true what people say, that Indians are too stu stupid to learn math." End of quote. Here, two factors supposedly absent have been included in the sum. These were the amounts relating to six ceramic pots purchased by the employee along with the meat from a deer, transactions made in the past but never paid the final amount had been correct, even if the operators taking into account to reach it were invisible. It should be noted, as Jean Leaf demonstrated in her research on the calculations made by U.S. adults when shopping in supermarkets, that the influence of non-mathematical principles on the formulation of problems and their results is not a characteristic exclusive to indigenous peoples. What stands out in the mentioned problem is not the difficulty of adding or subtracting, since the calculations were correct. The result only seems wrong because elements unforeseen by the teacher related to past transactions and kinship obligations were added to the calculation ideally focused on the tangible present. Unlike the supermarket shopping Americans, however, the moral calculations made by Amerindian people elicit a general negative view of their cognitive capacities. The erroneous calculations are, in the view of lay non-indigenous people, a natural consequence of the lack of numbers and counting systems. Diverse Native American languages are known to have no specific terms for numbers, while those that do often are limited to just a few numbers, which would suggest the inability of these populations to quantify and add up. Although some Amerindian groups are known to exhibit complex systems based 5, 10, and 20, here I shall concentrate on systems that became known in the literature as rudimentary. 
since this include that of the Wari, a people living in the southwest Amazonia who I have been studying for some decades and who will provide the book of the ethnographic data analyzed here. Uh, you can see the Wari and some other groups that will, will be mentioned in this uh, talk. According to the classification made by Diana Green in a survey of the numerical systems of 45 indigenous languages in Brazil, the Wari quantification system, though not included in the survey, would be base one, just like those of the Pirahã, Canela, Axaninka, Culina, and others. Along with base two systems, these systems are the linguist argues, associated with a global and holistic thought, her words, whose quantifiers are associated with the total context or the notion of totality. Contrasting with the analytic, and also her terms, and synthetic thought associated with base 10 and 20 systems. This classification is illustrated as follows. And I quote her, a man does not say, I'm going to chop down eight posts to make the house. He says, I'm going to chop down a post for each corner and, more, uh, and one more for each side. And if someone asks him how many he's going to chop down, he will reply, I'm going to chop down several. Describing these systems, Green continues, <coughs> even the meaning of the few terms utilized is not well defined. It's very common for the term two to mean some and the term three to mean many, since they are relative to the total. The Canela indigenous uh, people language, for example, has no specific numerical terms. It's limited, limited to general terms such as only, a pair, some, and many. You can see the, the numbers written. This is a blackboard in the classroom. This is my wadi brother. And he was trying to, to put the names for numbers. But I, I, I was not uh, studying this at the moment. So I got this picture, and I did not take a picture of the numbers, of course. <laughs> now I, I, you have to, you know, to see. Uh, just like the canela cited by Green, the Wari do not have specific numeral, numerical terms, and the quantifiers are limited to the unity, chikape, you can read there, which signifies alone, and the pair, tukukarakan, one facing the other, or tokwan, one of the terms for many, so two could be pair and many. <clears throat> Above two, they use terms for few or many, always relative, since they depend on the relational context, which is variable. For example, if hunters in a small village kill two peccaries, they will refer to their prey as many. But if they live in a densely populated village and have to distribute it, uh, the game to many, they killed a few. It seems to me that this mathematical proportionality, which for Green is related to a notion of totality, is less important than the intentionality involved in the calculations. Qualifying a number as many or few depends on what one wishes to emphasize or render invisible. Every anthropologist who has lived among an indigenous people knows perfectly well that the qualification of the product of a gathering or hunting expedition, as many or few, is related to the interest in sharing more or less. The calculation of kin also involves contextual sets. My older Wari friends, who never went to school, who doesn't speak Portuguese, use it to give different answers each time I, rec I recently arrived for a visit asked them how many grandchildren they had, whether they included grandchildren who lived far away in the nominal list or omitted them, dependent on whether the latter visit frequently. 
Although they do not have nominal quantifiers beyond two, which for its part may signify many, the wari can indicate larger quantities, up to 10, with their fingers, even without naming them, as Green and Gordon also observed for other systems of this type. However, the wari demonstrate no interest in expressing totalities when making an equivalence between the objects or persons cited in their narrative and their fingers. Even if sometimes they unite all the selected fingers in order to show a total amount, they soon lose interest in the sequence, often repeating the same fingers or frequently using just one hand. Uh, and we can see the same for the munduruku. So they will say, Maria, João, Pedro, I don't know, and this, and then they, they will just do this, 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 and when they arrive at, uh, at here, for example, they can change and get back to the first hand. So they are not very concerned about showing uh, the total to the other person because they can count like that and go, go to the same hand again. With the introduction of the school among the Wari at the beginning of the 1970s, founded by the same U.S. evangelical missionaries who catechized them, they learned the numbers in Portuguese, used for schoolwork and for commercial transactions with white people. However, following their access to so-called intercultural teaching at the start of the 2000s, relative, this teaching is relativist in approach, teachers began to ask them to translate numbers into their own language a sign of their respect for the different indigenous cultures present in the classroom. Without being able to access the effect of this uh, on the other indigenous people present in the multi-ethnic classrooms, I observed considerable embarrassment on the part of the Wari, who suddenly saw themselves poor in numbers. They had no name, so they are inventing. They begin then to try to settle on names on their language to signify other numbers beyond one and two. The term for few, parik, became the number three. Thereafter, they started to use somewhat randomly different terms for many and full to designate all the numbers from four to 10. This type of numbering remained confined to the classrooms and even there, with the exception of one alone, numbers are expressed in Portuguese when they do sums. The invention of names for numbers is not a phenomenon limited to the Wari. A recent article co-written by a Parcatej indigenous group uh, student and his non-indigenous teacher describes this process of invention, which the authors call, and I quote, an amplification and creation of the written and phonetic forms of numbers in Pakateje, based on public discussions with the community, including the approval of elders and leaders. Among the groups poor in numbers, an Amazonian case, that of the Piraham, became famous in the literature, generating an intense debate among anthropologists and linguists. Although studies based on cognitive tests and linguistic analysis uh, are controversial and have been subject to a variety of critics, it's worth uh, commenting on them rapidly, given the similarity to the ethnographic data on Wari arithmetic. In the case of the Pirahan, not only are the existing terms limited to one and two, going from there to many, but even the term for one is not stable, that's the author's saying, since it's also used to signify small, acquiring the meaning of roughly one, I'm quoting. A category inexistent, as Gordon, one of the authors, observes, in our system of whole numbers. <clears throat> Notably, Gordon and Everett ventured distinct hypotheses for the absence of numbers among the Piraha. For Gordon, it is related to the absence of nouns designating precise quantities. For Everett, 
Bordeaux, the question is not of linguistic determinism. Rather, he attributes the absence of numbers, and I quote, to cultural constraints, more precisely to the inability in principle to talk about things removed from personal experience. The Munduruku case, which became also uh, became equally well known, is also worth mentioning. Although, differently to the case discussed here, they exhibit a system in which the numbers three to five are composed from the numbers for one and two. According to Pika, however, although they can nominate up to five, they do not go beyond two to specify quantities not differentiating n plus 1 after 3 or 4, and may use the term for 5 for quantities of 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9 elements, for example. The author's conclusion is particularly interesting here, and I quote, uh, this crystallization of discrete numbers out of an initially approximate continuum of numerical magnitudes does not seem to occur in the Munduruku. I shall come back to this idea of a lack of crystallization, as well as the qualification by both Gordon and Everett of the one of the Pirahan as roughly one. The instability of one and the blue stones of Borges. As I observed earlier, the Wari term for one, chikape, has the meaning of alone, which in Wari sociocosmology points to a lack, not to the unity in itself. Someone is alone because they lack another, I suppose a relative. A single killed game animal is a sign of the hunter's lack of ability or luck. He lacks other praise. The most precise mathematical translation for alone would be minus n. Therefore, not the unity, such that the value of one is, as among the Piraham, approximate, always pointing to an absent other. The negative value given to one is not a characteristic exclusive to the Wari. It's common to various lowland groups, as diverse as the Caribe speaking in Garicó, studied by Virginia Amaral, the Tupi Guarani speaking Paracanã, by Carlos Fausto, and the Barasana, by Stephen Hugh Jones, for whom, and I quote Stephen Hugh Jones, the unity is incomplete and dangerous. Similarly, Ferreira, Mariana Leal Ferreira, in a study of the numerical concepts of the Chavante, relates the unity to solitude, contrasting it to the positive, to the positive uh, value given to two and to even numbers in general. Among the Yanomami, who also only have terms for the unity and the pair, passing afterwards to many, one can be expressed both by the term for alone yummy, which has the synonym of few, and by the term for almost, mori, in an interesting approximation to the notion of roughly one of the piraha. Another case of interest is that of the Arawete, studied by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro and Camila de Cou, whose term for the unity, tisipe, is also the term for alone, a quality also expressed by jije, without anything, without, alone. This is Camila Deco data. DJ indicates a lack, the dissociation of a connected element. To eat meat without a plant-based complement and vice versa is to eat DJ, since they should always be eaten together. As I observed earlier, it's interesting to note that although the schooled Wari have adopted the names for numbers in Portuguese, they remained monolingual for one, always using the term for alone. So they count, they count alone, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
Okay, so they never use one, they use alone. In a previous work, <coughs> Uh, this peculiarity of the numerical system currently used by the Wadi prompted me to suggest the incompatibility between their thought and the notion of unity objectified in the number one, so central to Christianity. The idea of one is a core notion for the fundamentalist evangelical missionaries who catechized the Wadi in the Bible, which they take literally they identify various passages that extol the value of one and unity, either directly or indirectly, through a critique of duality, as appears in the following verse from the book of Proverbs 2010, virtually an explicit course in moral mathematics. And I quote from the Bible, double measures and double standards are an abomination to the Lord. The opposition is not original, and indeed, I was led to it via Levi Brühl in his chapter on numeration in How Natives Think. In his words, the unity has maintained a prestige upon which the monotheistic religions and the monist philosophies plume themselves. Duality is often the antithesis of unity by qualities which are diametrically opposite. Many languages still preserve in their vocabulary traces of this opposition, and we speak of double life, duplicity, etc. The opposition between the unity and the pair was also noted by Pierre Clastres in, his, in a chapter of his most famous work, Society against state, the state, based on the Guarani ethnography. Clastres attributes the valorization of the two or double in opposition to the one to the pregnancy of an anti-identity ethos among indigenous peoples. In his words, the imperfect earth where things in their totality are one is the reign of the incomplete and the space of the finite. It is the field of strict application of the identity principle. For to say that A equals A, this is this, and a man is a man, is to simultaneously state that A is not A. To name the oneness in things, to name things according to their oneness, is tantamount to assigning them limits of finitude incompleteness. Incompleteness is not due, therefore, as we tend to think, to the openness of the set, but to it, to the openness of the set, of course, but to its delimitation and closure. The one and the double are central themes in the work of Levi-Strauss particularly explicit in his analysis of a set of myths related to twins. The myths drew his attention to the difference between twins in Indo-European mythology, who, though initially different, are eventually conceived as identical, and twins in the myths of the Americas, who become increasingly different over the course of life. The author concludes Therefore, that in relation to the Americas, all unity contains within itself a duality. This is not, however, a simple duality, but a dualism in a perpetual state of disequilibrium, whose dynamic had been prefigured almost 40 years earlier in the author's analysis of the relation between diametric and concentric dualist systems. Not just Christian morality, properly speaking, valorized the unity. As Vernon observed, the Greek geometry and mathematics that gave rise to modern science of the kind taught in classrooms developed through the fixing of a point of view for observing celestial bodies whose orbit became measurable and predictable in a world conceived in spherical terms. By contrast, 
diverse Amazonian universe, including those of the so-called poor in numbers, the Pirahã, are composed of superimposed layers and therefore largely incompatible with the unification of perspective implied in the notion of center. In these universes, each different layer constitutes a world apart, inhabited by beings with distinct viewpoints whose interaction involves a complex play of perspectives. While the association between mathematics and culture and ontology or ontology is undeniable, I tentatively propose, this is a work in the making, a different connection to this made by Everett and Green. Everett, we may recall, makes the association through the idiom of luck. Few numbers, imprecision and difficulty in counting are, he argues, related to the disinterest and in everything that goes beyond immediate experience. Which, uh, which seems odd when we learn about the complex cosmology of the Pirahã and the importance of invisible spirits in everyday life. For Green, the association is positive. Peoples with few or no numbers demonstrate holistic thought focus on the totality. While the objection, objection to Everett's simplistic cultural, culturalism is clear in the criticism of, of the commentators to his article in uh, Current Anthropology, Green's holism should be questioned precisely because of the incompatibility between the idea of totality and Amazonian relational and perspectivist thought which projects a coexistence of multiple worlds that never overlap or add up. Characteristic of peoples like the Wari, the Pirahan, and the Canela, to cite only those mentioned here. Very briefly, perspectivist ontologies are grounded on the existence of different kinds of beings people, animals, and even plants and objects that see themselves as humans and share a similar culture, but have different bodies, which make them inhabit different worlds. Perspectives are always divergent within what we could call species. So, for example, every human being drinks beer, but for the jaguar, what is beer is blood, although for the wari, it's maize fermented beverage. It's not a question, therefore, of passive perspectives to be combined in order to reconstitute a given world, as in our universalistic relativism. Perspectivism implies the existence of different universes, averse to unification. In my view, for the way at least, this unstable world explains their interest in maintaining the sets open and quantities unstable. Things are, of course, more complex. As is known, several perspectivist people have precise counting systems, which is the case of the Amazonian Palikur and Kashinawa, for example, and some other. Several North American indigenous peoples are even obsessed with counting and some sorts of things, counting some sorts of things. As Green shows, even indigenous people who traditionally do not count rapidly manage to define precise quantities when dealing with objects of external origin and in transactions with whites, whether or not they adopt Western numeration. This is the pastor of the Wadi Church counting uh, the copyright money for Pray and Pray to distribute uh, among other pastors. Maybe the answer, you know him, maybe the answer to this apparent paradox could be found in Greg Urton's well-known study of the Canelo's Quechua ontology and its related counting system embedded in social life, which makes a difference between things that can be counted and things that cannot. This is, in fact, the title of the article we will examine now regarding the instability of sex. 
co-authored by a mathematician and a philosopher, both Nuremberg, suggestively titled Knowledge from Pebbles, What Can Be Counted and What Cannot. The article explores the question of the instability of the constitutive elements of sets in a very interesting way. The authors base their idea around a tale by Jorge Luis Borges called Blue Tigers, which I shall provide a summary based on Borges' original text, somewhat extended, given how much it enchanted me. Now I pass to Borges. This is a wadi uh, draw from a kid. It's a, it's a jaguar. A Scottish professor of logic teaching at an Indian university lives in a world founded on rationality, save for his obsession with tigers, which populate his dreams. One day he learns of a report that in a village in the region of the Ganges were found blue tigers, which he would have ignored had it not been for the fact that the tigers in his dreams had turned blue. Consequently, he decided to go to the village to encounter the tigers, but the local inhabitants, though pretending to guide him, never put him on the right path. One night, while everyone was asleep, asleep, he decided to explore alone a plateau that they had told him was prohibited, since the gods turned all those who ventured there blind or mad. Suddenly, he sees a blue, a bright blue color in a crevice on the ground, in the ground, exactly the same colors, the same color as the tigers in his dreams. They are pebbles smoothly rounded and regular in size, like those used to count. He places a small handful in one of his pockets and returns home. When he puts his hand in, uh, in his pocket to remove the pebbles, he notes that they were now more than the amount he had collected. And he says, I would look fixedly at any one of them, pick it up with my thumb and index finger, yet when I had done that, when that one disc was separated from the rest, it would have become many. Henceforth, the philosopher begins to closely observe these stones that multiply or diminish without any logic. And he says, I picked up the discs, raised them high, dropped them, scattered them, watched them grow and multiply or mysteriously dwindle. And he continues. There are mathematicians who say that, that, that 3 plus 1 is a tautology for 4, a different way for saying 4. But I, Alexander Krejci, of all men on earth, was fated to discover the only objects that contradict that essential law of the human mind. If 3 plus 1 can be 2 or 14, the reason is madness. Naturally, the four mathematical operations, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, were impossible. The stones resisted arithmetic as they did the calculation of probability. Forty disks divided might become nine. Those nine in turn divided might yield 300. End of Borges. Nirenberg and Nirenberg use Borges' powerful image to critique the set theory that founds mathematics. According to the authors, if we ask a mathematician what counting is, he or she will reply that to count a finite set is to assign to its elements in a one-to-one -one manner the numbers one, two, three, n, without missing any other, any one of the latter. Everything is given previously, such that this type of problem begins with the phrase, Given a set A, or given the elements of the set A, or given the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, that's the, the beginning. Uh, in the author's words, we assumed that there is no question as to what elements belong to the set. And we assumed that an element X is not changed by being counted in the set. The characteristic of the elements of the set, the authors state in another work, is that they must be apathy, inert, which means that nothing happens to the elements of X or Y 
when we place it together. There is no change in identity, they say. The examples that the authors provide to contradict apathy are, among others, the chemical elements, which combine and transform when in contact. The basis of this apathy is the principle of identity, the same cited earlier by Clastris. For every x, x equal x. All any counting system requires is a first number, which may be 0 or 1, and that the next number can be stated, such and such a number plus 1. What is not taken into account is that, in contrast to the stones that serve as the basis, as the basis for various counting systems, other things in the words, I quote the authors, are more difficult to count, whether because they are more subject to becoming, as the philosophers would say, that is, to change in the act of counting so that it becomes difficult to speak of the one, or because they are subject to transformative interaction when brought together with another so that we can speak of the one plus one. The authors also assert in the other article mentioned that the axioms of uh, set theory imply that, I quote, any rigorous attempt to base an ontology upon them will entail such a drastic loss of life and experience that the result can never amount to an ontology in any humanly meaningful sense. The crucial mathematical question regarding the Amazonia quantifying system seems to be, therefore, the indefinition of one, which we saw is related there to the negative value attributed to the unity. As we have seen, for the constitution of a numerical system like ours, whose elements are composed by n plus 1, it has important consequences. The centrality of the unity for Western mathematical thought leads the authors, along with the same path as Levi Brühl, to Christian monotheism. And I quote the authors, note how math works here for monotheism. By modeling divine creation on the eternal identity of the number one and the repetitive move of the one plus one, the multiplicity of the cosmos is created while the unity of being is maintained. The blue stones and their non-apathetic behavior lead me, before returning to the Wadi, to another ethnographic context that is very distinct, but we could say equally blue. I refer to the writing of the Tagalog of the Philippines in the 17th century, analyzed in the monograph by Vicente Rafael. On arriving there and noting that the natives had a form of writing the Jesuit missionaries opted to use it for catechism. However, there was an aspect of this writing that they did not recognize and eventually led them to abandon it in favor of Spanish. While for the Spanish Catholic missionaries, writing existed independently of the speaker, for the Tagalog, writing was completely subsumed to reading, which had an aleatory character where the same characters were associated with different sounds and meanings, depending on the reader. The term babayin, designating writing in Tagalog, associated reading with floating over a stream of sounds elicited by the characters. The idea of an oscillating and indefinite uh, world allows me to re return to the wadi, again, to, to finish until the solidification of Christian experience after a revival in 2001, two classificatory categories organized their entire lived world. Wari, which signifies us, people, predator, and Karawa, which signifies animal, food, prey. These were not fixed categories, though, but positions which could be occupied by different kinds of beings alternately. Either the Wari saw themselves in the predator position, and therefore human, or in the prey position, since this was how they were seen by animals who saw themselves as human. <clears throat> in sum, the distribution of beings in categories depended on the perspective of themselves and others and on the relational configuration in which 
they saw themselves inserted. In other words, if we try to encounter analogies between Karawa and our notion of nature, as some authors might have suggested, it's essential to recognize that the core of its definition was its positional character, making Wari and Karawa sets with variable contents and implying the idea of a highly unstable nature characteristic of perspectivism and therefore distinct from the idea that founds the scientific view, at least the school version presented to the Wari. In the 1980s and 1990s, prior to the Christian revival, the shamans told me that they never enjoyed success on hunting trips and that their wives criticized them for the fact. The problem was that they looked at a deer and got ready to shoot, but it would suddenly turn into a paca, and then an armadillo. And sometimes it appeared like a person. They were unable to have a fixed image precisely because these animals changed form. And not only this, the shamans also knew that an animal like the paca, for example, was, in the eyes of the jaguar, a papaya, or that maize beer was, for the latter animals, blood. There was, therefore, no stable universe of objects that formed sets capable of being identified or counted. Potentially, nothing was self-identical, and returning to the terms of the Nirenbergs, the elements of the Wari and Karawa sets transformed constantly when in contact with each other. This does not mean that there were no zones of stability in the Wari world, since this was precisely what they sought to produce in their day-to-day -day lives, transforming others including newborn children, into king, that is, people who shared the same perspective and sustained a common world. This was, however, a derived apprehension considered limited by the Wari, since the gaze of the shamans had epistemological privilege over other people. Shamans are those with free eyes, while the, others, the eyes of others are tied up. And before you change, this is a, a photo made by Dushan Boric, my friend who is here, who has been with me among the Wadi. We do not need to turn to shamanism. The problems posed by relational and invariable elements for set theory are explicit in everyday questions in the classroom. In a math class on the intercultural teaching degree course that I watched in April 2015, specifically on set theory, the teacher, based on the ethnicity of his students, draw on the board a circle that he called a tupari set and stated, Fernando is not a member of the tupari set. Immediately, a surui, another people, group, student, recalled that the children of mixed couples and asked a tupari student if the patrineality rule applied for them. The Surui added that now they do the same as the whites. As his wife is Kampé and he is Surui, his daughter was registered as Kampé Surui. As the lesson continued, explaining the notion of membership, the teacher concluded, how can it be said that there is a Zoro, another indigenous group, who isn't a Zoro? Though it would be absurd, said the teacher. We know, however, that in this is precisely the case of Amazonian identities, since being a Zoro is not a universal fact or a reality, but one perspective among others, which must necessarily be associated with a person or group. These are some recent pictures of a mathematics, uh, math class, uh, a science class, and they were, they were taken from the cell phones, the drawings. I wish to conclude with the fact that the Wadi opted to maintain the term alone for the unity while adopting Portuguese nouns for the other numerical terms. Like diverse Christian translations among the Wadi, comparable to the portmanteau words used by Lewis Carroll in his Alice, allowing translation between 
distinct ontologies, they alone seems to me to have the same function in the school universe. It takes them from the universe of precision to the world of the more or less, to invert an expression by Coiré, and maintains the indefinition of elements as, con as a constitutive part of their perspectival universe. When Borges, professor of logic, sought to find some pattern that would allow him to conceive a model for the multiplication of the blue stones, he discovered that the only clear principle was that a stone could not multiply when it was alone, isolated from the others. The isolation of the unity implies precisely the paralyzation of the system evoked by Levistrus, the end of the capacity of self-reproduction of the blue stones. The danger of the unity made explicit by the Barasana Indians resides then not in its indefinition, which makes it open to the other, but precisely in its association with our one. Thank you very much. I need, I need a paper and pen. Okay. Yes. So now we will hear from initial comments and a question or two from uh, our own Fernando Codamares. If, if, if you look at 50, 50, 50, 50. Okay. I think Fernando has to put the... No? The no? no? no, no. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for the invitation to be here for Brazil Lab in Princeton. I'm happy to be here. <coughs> I think it's a great initiative. It's also a pleasure to meet Parecido Vilasa personally. We've been communicating by, by email. Um, uh, João has asked me to say some words and maybe ask some questions, so I'll gladly comply. Um, I'm a mathematician, so my specialization is mathematics and so this world of abstraction and pure and pure thought. So, I, and I think it is actually good that we all have our specializations because they make us more effective. Um, but it's also nice to be able to interact with other disciplines. It can be, it can be very inspiring and, and challenging, also. So, as a mathematician, I'd like to say. Um, some words about mathematics, and then I'll ask <coughs> a couple of questions. So first of all, what is, what is number? And when I, when I say number, I mean the, the natural number. So this, the number is used for, for counting, one, two, three, four, five, <coughs> and so on. And I <coughs> take this opportunity actually to say that I disagree with the critique of, of set theory referred to in the, in the talk. I mean, the, the whole idea of mathematics is to start from simple things, and on top of that, you build more complex ones. So I'm pretty sure that the chemical elements, the, there is mathematics there. It's just that you know, it's more complex, so you have to build from the foundations. And the foundations have to be simple, so like the arithmetic of, of natural numbers. And for the mathematicians, the Nirenbergs here, they're not the Louis, Louis Nirenberg, the, the analyst who unfortunately passed away recently. Okay, going back to the, to the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on, well, we all have uh, an intuitive idea of what number is, but what is it for, for a mathematician? Um, so let me give you an example. So let's say we have five apples and five baskets. So, I mean, this is mathematics, okay? <laughs> so apples and baskets are very different objects, but we are using the same, same word um, here, namely five. So why is that? Well, we use the same word because in this case there was a one-to-one -one correspondence. So we can put each apple in a different uh, basket and there will be a perfect match. But if you add an apple, then things change, and this one-to-one -one 
correspondence uh, is not possible anymore. So mathematician would say that the sets now belong to different uh, equivalence classes. So you actually need a word to differentiate them. In this case, it would be six. We added uh, an apple. So number is like an equivalence, an equivalence relation for a mathematician that comes from this idea of one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. Um, so the study of the Wari tribes, uh, I think it's very fascinating, or other Amazonian tribes, really, because it kind of, well, at least to me, it tells me that uh, the in a sense for number that uh, the humans have is very approximate. Um, uh, so if I show you five pebbles, for instance, you can kind of tell just by looking at it that I mean, there are five pebbles there, but if I show you 12 pebbles, then you won't be able to say that uh, there are 12 pebbles there right away, so you need to count. And counting requires an effort, an effort requires a need. And the strongest need of all, I think, is the need for, for survival. So, so how does mathematics arise, really? This is a very interesting question. I'm not a historian, maybe there are historians here, but it seems that by looking at the history of the human species, um, more sophisticated mathematics first arises from practi practical needs in agricultural societies. Engineering, for instance, if you want to build a canal and then you want to know how many people you need to be able to finish the canal in a certain time, so you need to be able to compute volumes or the volume of geometric figures. If you want to tax people who own property, uh, you need to compute, the, compute areas. And there's astronomy and seasons, trade, it's really uh, fundamental. Well, the Greeks were a different thing. I mean, the Greeks were the first to realize the mathematics is really uh, a different, well, separate world, coherent world that has its own tools and can be studied and developed without necessarily a direct link to, to reality. Those are the Greeks. But before, there were practical needs. So all that leads to my first question. Um, <clears throat> so could it be that um, the Wari people uh, don't have words for, say, numbers beyond five because they don't need those numbers? Um, so those, those names, uh, these names are not, would not be maybe useful for their everyday lives, their, their survival challenges, and they, their way of life. So maybe it could be that um, they don't have these names because of their way of life. So it'd be more about the way of life rather than the world, world view. So that's the, the first question. Do they really need numbers, uh, names for, for numbers beyond five and, and, and so on? And the other question is also related to a philosophical theme, which is important, uh, is the effectiveness of, of mathematics in, in describing the day-to-day -day world. I mean, we know that, so probably some of you have used GPS to arrive here. You know, and, I mean, there's, there's mathematics there, and it works. Uh, of course, we don't have answers to all questions, but we have enough that we, we do have technology. And it's really a mystery why uh, the everyday, wor everyday world can be described in terms of mathematical, mathematical rules. So the blue pebbles of, of Borges, I think, <laughs> also very interesting, seem to be like a, to me like a metaphor for, for something without mathematic, mathematics mm -hmm. in it, with no pattern at all. So it's like the, the realm of the, of the magical. But the, you know, the relationship to, to magic is a relationship, let's say, of, of awe, amazement, or admiration, but not of understanding. So if something follows no pattern, it is impossible to, to comprehend it. So the, the other question to Aparecida is, do you believe in blue pebbles? Or if you don't, don't want to answer that question, I can ask 
another one. So the Wari people or maybe the Tupari, I don't know, or the other Wari, uh, yeah. Amazonian tribes, they are very sophisticated spiritually speaking. So what would be their reaction if they are shown the, the blue pebbles of, of Borges? So would they be uh, surprised or would they just say, well, mm -hmm. that's how the world is? Okay. Mm, that's Thanks. so good. Question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. Wonderfully thoughtful and provocative so and Thank deeply <laughs> engaging. Aparecido, do you want to? Yes, of course. Okay. Do I need a microphone? No, it's there. It's working. Yeah. The one that you have on oh, is working. Oh, so it's already there. Yes. yes. So, so the way we'll go, Aparecido will collect some of her thoughts, will reply to, to Fernando, and then we'll open up to you all and we'll collect bundles. <laughs> of <laughs> questions, <laughs> okay? So we encourage you all to try to ask your question in the most condensed form as possible so we can collect as many perspectives as possible. Okay, so Parisit. Thank you so much. I, I think that those commentaries were precious because in fact I'm uh, very ashamed to talk in front of a mathematician and that kind of uh, that we have here. So. Um, because it, it's, you know, a friend of mine who is a historian of, of Greek mathematics, Rivio Nets, Nitz, I don't know if you know him, but he's from Stanford, he said, this is not mathematics. Okay, this is not. The problem is that it might be not mathematics, but that's what the teachers tell them. So I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, my f you know, what I, I've been experiencing in my field work. So the way they never had mathematics. They had no mathematics, but now they have and they are poor in numbers. So that's my, the, the beginning of my problem. My problem is that uh, what they, they do not have, what they, they, their absence of numbers, is defined as a problem in mathematics. So that's where I begin from. So I, I, that's why I'm talking about mathematics. This is not, uh, did, did not come from you know, my perception, because I've been working with them for 30, uh, before that, like 25 years, and not ever talked about mathematics and counting because there there was no mathematics and counting. So that's my my first uh, statement. And uh, about counting for survival, so I don't know if it's the you know because they have the same environment as several other people who count. So the Kashinawa, for example, the Paliku, they do count. And the Wari live in the same environment, so they, they have the same kind of quantities. They deal with the same kind of quantities and things, and they do not count. And what I'm trying to do here is not to see it as a, a lack of, but to see something positive, not in the moral sense, but in the intellectual sense of why they do not count. As, so, the, you know, I just have a, a hypothesis, something that I'm, I'm getting to that is not, you know, finished. But I'm, I'm trying to think about their reasons as if, as if they were rejecting something that they could have done. But this is something that is not also mathematics. because And so, um, so for their survival, the, you know, the first question, I think that they, they do not need more or less than people who count. So we have a problem. Are they, because what the teachers, uh, when they arrive, they say, you are stupid, you cannot count. See, some people in the, in the classroom where I was, and when I saw they were ashamed because they could not say, that, and the, the teachers say, go to your elders, you have to, do, you don't have to ask them because maybe you lost the name for numbers. They could not conceive that you don't have. So they were ashamed. And some people in the, in the classroom, they had numbers. So, you know, because they are from different uh, indigenous groups. And so we have this, this problem there. And that's my, my starting point. How to tell the Wari uh, that they have mathematical thought. Because mathematical thought is what they were talking about, not what I, I... So this is not because of they do not need for survival. That's something that I, 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 I don't think I could say. And I, I loved your second question. This is one of my favorite questions that I have. Elle. Do you believe in blue pebbles? That's, that's very important. Uh, I don't. I don't. But I think that the Wadi, and what, 
what if the Wadi met the Blue Pebbles? Uh, what would they do? Uh, I think they're going to find it very funny. I think that they will think that those came from the whites because we can do everything. We, can, we are magical from their point of view. We are the magic people. We can uh, make things multiply. We can make a series of things. We can make uh, airplanes, everything. So why not pebbles to multiply? And they will not count, as our philosopher here uh, were counting, was counting like one, two, and then 300. They would say, oh, suddenly it's many. Those people, they know how to do things. They know how to do airplanes, and they make those crazy uh, stones uh, multiply. So, and just continuing that, I think that not believing in blue pebbles or magic, as I, I don't, doesn't mean that magic and blue pebbles could not have their own effect on lives of people. So I think this is the most important question, not that if I believe or not, but what believing in blue pebbles or in jaguars that, that drink blood or, and have culture uh, do with people's lives? So it, it, uh, of course it has consequence for people's lives, and that's what I am as an anthropologist studying how not about beliefs, but about how life turns around when people think that the jaguar is a human. Okay, I, 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 I do not uh, say anything about it, I mean. I don't think jaguars are human, of course, but it means something for them, and it changes their lives, because they can encounter a jaguar, and the jaguar could kidnap, could look like a mother, or a father, or a, or a relative, and kidnap the person. So it has consequences for you know their thought, their their way of life of, of living. So that's that's what I think. But very very nice to have this question. Thank you. So let's continue collect a few more questions. And if people want to jump in and make associations with Aparecida said and build on the questions that Fernando asked as well. So let's collect the first set of questions. So we have uh, Vinicius, yeah, Navjeet, and then Michael, yes, and Federico. Najid? Very. Very very people who have this kind. And my second question is a little uh, uh, stemming from uh, uh, the, the remarks, which is on, or maybe it depends of mathematics in a way, um, is that when the idea of alone comes, and you've uh, sort of spelled it out a lot on the idea of the one, I was trying to think that how do the worry people have any conception of the idea of nothing, which will sort of 
tie up to the idea of zero, because then zero in mathematics is not sort of something, an arithmetical thing which appears, but it first appears only in the sense of placeholder, and then perhaps sort of ties to the number theory. So mathematics also sort of allows the space for something which is a placeholder first, or something which is not counted. So I was wondering that how Gwari people sort of associate with the idea of nothing. There can be something roughly one or almost one, but what if someone were not to have a child or not to have a cow, that sort of does not tie up to the idea of a one, but something before one. So do they have a concept of that? Okay, great, excellent. Thank you. Michael? My question was exactly the first question that was asked about time, so I, I will skip. You're great, excellent. Federico? That's great. Uh, could you go back to the picture where the, the pastor is, uh, is counting money, mm -hmm. please? Mm -hmm. uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go back to this, <laughs> but let me uh, start by the first one about time. So the worry they do not have, uh, they have of course past tense, future tense, so something that happened in the past you say it happened, but for the future it might happen. You, you never say, uh, tomorrow I'll meet you, tomorrow I may meet you, so that's it. So they, they have a, a special uh, te verb tense to say things about the future. So when they translate the Bible, they do not say, uh, Jesus said, I'm coming, or they, they said, Jesus said, I might come, okay, because it's future. So, and when they, they, they talk about time, they, they have gestures, so, for example, it's, they, count, they, they know the, the, the time of the day through the sun, the position of the sun. So the sun goes like that, so when a person is uh, doing a narrative, so I had to film the narrative because sometimes the narrative is silent, because he said, then I went to the forest, he would do like that. But it's not that it's exact, so that's the sun going down and going down and going down. So this is almost three days. Mm -hmm. So that's the way he will uh, say three days. But he's not, he, he does not look for precision. So sometimes he says this just to say that he slept a lot. So time is, is marked for sleeping. Sometimes he, the person takes his fingers or her fingers saying that, I slept, I slept, I slept, and then I arrived. And counting, as I, as I told you, I was just filming and talking to people, counting, not counting. They were nominating, they were particularizing with their fingers because they say, Pedro, João, and this, and this, and Elizabeth, and then, and then just, they, they do this, like that. They put together and particularize. So, and they have, uh, talking to Federico and, and, and the same uh, question, ordinal numbering, they say, they, say they have just first, middle or something that came after the first, so there is the first, something that came after, and then came after, and then came after, and the end. So a, a, a woman that uh, is in menopause, has no more uh, children, she would say that, that, that the end, she, she got to the end, it's, it's a name for tail, 
that's the name for the tail. So, and they don't have, I, I was asking them many questions on that, but they don't have, you know, uh, a difference between the second and the third, except if you say uh, it came after the second, but they do not, uh, or, or for example, if you have something full of, 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 of beer, uh, maize beer, if you, you know, they have the, the word for full, for middle, more or less, and no. But they don't have three quarters, for example. They don't have a word for that. They, they, they just have, a, they have it. So about exchange rituals, they worry they don't have. But some people, the Barasana they do have, but they count, the, the, the Barasana counts. So some people in Amazonia do count, the Shinguan people who have, so people who have more exchanging uh, rituals, they, they usually they have a more precise counting. And you have it in, in, in Papua New Guinea, you have many, I think that the area of the world of, about you know, native peoples, indigenous people, that you have more work on, on, on indigenous mathematics is Papua New Guinea. If you, if you are interested, go there, because they have a very complex way of counting. And when they, they do huge exchange rituals and they tally things, like they, they organize things in space just to tally uh, one in front of the other and everything. And what they do not have. And they have a, a, a word for absence, which is omna, which is nothing. So do you have prey? Nothing. Do you have children? Nothing. Do you have, uh, so that's, 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 it's totally different from alone. They don't have, this is emptiness. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, the lack of anything. And of course they translated it now when they are at school for zero. But they do not make ten like alone, uh, no, and, and emptiness. They they never would put. They they will never conceive something like putting the word for alone, which is one, and the zero to complement to make the ten. Uh, you know, it's inconceivable something. So they say ten. They would like to say two, three, four, ten because that's that's the way they learn numbers. But they can't anymore. They have to go to their own language. So they are, you know, it's something. Uh, imposed on them. And, and Federico, uh, ordinality, I told about, you know, time and, and so they count time the way I told you, very in no precise way. And of course now they can count, they make counts in Portuguese and they count money. But that's very interesting because I brought them the money that I share with them, the money of uh, the copyright. And I decided to give to the church because I've been working in the church and et cetera. I had, in the way, had no leaders. So I, I had no people to give the money of the book. So I, I took to the church. I had no choice, although I'm not uh, a very pro-evangelical work, but I had to give to the pastor. And the pastor decided that he would give to several churches that they have in different villages. And then, there were, you know, 50, uh, bills of 50 reais. And the, 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 the young people there were saying that, just let, let, let's put, I don't know, 300, 400, and 400, but he couldn't. So this was the beginning. So he was sitting in this bench like that. So he put two and two bills. He just piled two and two. So the whole bench here was with two, 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 two up to the end because that's the way he, he knew how to, to distribute the money, making pairs. Yeah, so that's what happened. But the young people were beside him, no, 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 don't do that. It's just, you know, it would take a long time. Just, it, it, he couldn't, he just went back to the, the pile, piling off to, but he never went to school and. It's wonderful. Can we collect the next uh, uh, set of questions? Yes, please. I have a question for the mathematician. Um, it seems to me ethnocentric that we say our counting system is the right one. And we have lots of support from other cultures that agree that our counting system, our counting numbers, our imaginary numbers, our irrational numbers, that those are the right ones. And they exist in a sort of mathematical space that we presume to be correct. And yet, what you've just heard is that the Wari have a way to have the number two be few if there's a big crowd to feed and you only have two pockets, 
but the number two can also be many if you have two pockets, only a few people have seen it. And it seems to me that our Western numbers really don't have that ability to, to be contextualized, to, to absorb the context. Two's two. And in um, arithmetic counting numbers, two's always two. But they have a two that can be a big two or a little two. And I wonder whether Western mathematics could benefit in any way from having a two that had context awareness of what's in the, con uh, the context in which it's placed. And since you brought up Papua New Guinea, I have to tell you one Margaret Mead story from one of her uh, Sepik River tribes who counted one, two, three, dog. This dog is four feet. One and dog, two and dog, three and dog, and the next number is dog, dog, for eight. And then after dog, dog, it's many. That's Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Lauren? Yeah, so thank you so much for both the paper, which is so beautiful, and also the mathematical commentary. So, uh, briefly. So, yeah, along these lines, it seems to me, actually, that there are probably lots of systems of correspondence and equivalence to use the mathematical, mathematical language that just aren't named as such in this language. And I just wonder, you know, this idea that magic is de facto lacking order and pattern and stuff. I mean, perhaps mathematics in art from this vantage point just hasn't articulated the formulas and established precise equivalences here. And it's hard to name with numbers the, di the different constantly provisional in flux and transforming states of matter. For example, the shaman's cray and something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't possibilities for rendering precise equivalences and correspondences in some possible universe of abstract language. And even the ancient Greeks keep um, being that invoked. And I think like Pythagoras himself, a lot of his mathematical theories were first articulated as divinatory or as healing capacities, like mm. the ratios of frequencies for instruments mm. used to heal people mm. and stuff like that. He had a whole mystery school and all the problems. Mm. That's great, great. Marilia, and then Mara, and then Luke. Then we'll wrap up. Yes. So and then there's a reception afterwards for the conversation to continue. Yes. So two related questions. One, if you can um, say to us a little bit about the um, polemics with Chomsky, uh, with the Peter Ham and Everett. So we, if I remember, it was something they to the, uh, there was a big fight over in the, that uh, uh, description of the Peter Ham and Chomsky, and then the grammar, the universal grammar. Mm -hmm. So if you can remind some points about that. And the, the other related question, transversal question is, uh, think about perspectivism and in relation to this <coughs> system of no anti-identity. Uh, in your field experience, is there an example of this in relation to gender discussions, male, female, or anything in between that, or mm. no? Mm -hmm. Good. Mena, yeah. comments, uh, what would the linguists say about the, uh, the way that they count and their relationship with their language? Thank you. In your, in your presentation, you did bring this mm -hmm. somehow, but maybe there is something deeper between mm -hmm. your concept of counting and their language, mm -hmm. the structure of their language. Um, and although I'm not a mathematician, I'm a physicist, so I did study some mathematics, and uh, to me, for instance, I, I see more similarities between their system and, and the Western system, in the sense that, for example, um, when we, we think about infinity, um, we, 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 when we, we, we are first taught about infinity, we, we are taught that it's a very big number mm -hmm. that we count, and then when you can think of a very big number and you can still keep counting and the number is just much bigger than you can think of. Mm. And maybe their sort of lower bound for infinity is just very low. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just lower than what... That, what That's very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, the other thing that uh, uh, um, I saw, you know, in your in your in your talk was this concept of um, duality that comes comes uh, very often there. And in, in in Western thought, duality came um, very strongly with uh, quantum physics when you talk about the duality of uh, particle and waves. You know, light can be uh, wave can also be a pebble, and mm. it manifests itself in, in these two phases, and and it's it's intrinsic in nature. Um, the other thing is also um, the, the the idea between discrete and uh, uh, continuity that somehow is there when when this idea of one is something that it's almost mm -hmm. it's almost there, it's incomplete. So it's almost like between zero and one, you have infinite numbers. So if, if you go to your real number numbering system. So um, mm. I wonder that they're not so much different than, than what we think. It's just that they, they're using a different basis, for instance. Mm. It's just a comment. Perfect. So we have Luke, and then we had someone else had asked. No? OK, Luke. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I just wanted to build on that question to, to, to make an observation, a question that um, the Luke, the what I took as the use of the blue pebbles in this case was the gesture towards perspectivism, that things are unstable and so forth, they can be seen from different perspectives. And I was thinking that one way we might render the analytic of perspective in mathematical terms is the idea of scale. Um, and in Western mathematics, we have, for example, Cantor's sets, right? Cantor's sets such that um, sets are, have a stable number of elements at a particular scale, but in, for example, a fractal zoom, you do have infinity, right? And so my question to you is, do you believe in Cantor's sets? Um, if you, I mean, I think that's a fair question. <laughs> but, and, I, and I also, and that's paired with the question of, in your, you suggested that the origins of numbers were, were rooted in the pragmatics of intersubjective cooperation, the idea that individuals evolved to sort of align themselves with the reality that's out there. We can agree on this reality so that we can act on it together. Um, and my understanding is that is what, that's a psychologistic explanation. The, what a number theory would have to transcend the psychological individual to render a an understanding of reality that links the linguistic, the psychology, psychological, and the logical as distinct realms, right? And so I don't have a, question here, but I just wanted to note that throughout this discussion, we've been shifting back and forth between the logical, the psychological, and the linguistic as frames of analysis that lead us to sort of situate epistemic disjunctions in different places. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if that might be a useful tool for thinking through the ethnocentrism mm -hmm. of these, of these, of where these conversations stop. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe if I could, if I could jump in, and then maybe we'll ask Al Fernando to respond to some of those questions. Then we'll all continue the conversation over drinks and uh, and snacks uh, and the reception. I wonder, perhaps, that you can say a little bit more because um, my sense is that um, the one plays a key role here, Christianity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Somehow that's that's the the thing against which this very mm -hmm. philosophy or ontology or perspectivism mm -hmm. evolves and crystallizes, right? So there's something about that nemesis somehow and against which this form of thinking gets actualized, almost like a counter critique or a counter mm -hmm. philosophy. I don't, I don't know the, the name it is, but if you can elaborate a little bit more because that so has had been so devastating to them, speaking of survival, right? And I think at the same time, you still go there and you, the money goes to the pastors, you know, so you have a conflictual, a difficult relationship to that. But you want to respect the ways they are handling with their conversion, their incorporation in this other worldview, right? Paleto, you know, your beloved father, right? He, he will go to heaven. He will no longer go to the waters when he passes away. And that was, for you, was very difficult to reckon with, right? So. Mm. There, there was the, maybe the desire of a magical thinking. You know, what could happen if you were to go to heaven? Maybe, maybe that the peoples would be there. So there is something on the realm of the very ordinary, historical ordinary condition of these peoples that's so dominated by the one. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to find some latitude in their existence 
and that, that they are sharing with you in this lack that's within the one. That's, that's very, very important. I think that maybe Fernando could yeah. uh, begin answering yes. uh, the questions yes. that were yes. aimed to him. I will start answering the questions on the side here. Um, <coughs> so mathematics has, has to be precise and rigorous because that's how we can make progress because we're always like building on something that came before and in other sciences you can see things, maybe you can repeat experiments, but in mathematics the, I mean, the criteria is that it has to be rigorous. Uh, we need to prove things. But that kind of sounds like maybe for non-mathematicians that it's not very flexible, which is actually not true. I mean, um, mathematics can be very flexible. And, uh, study structures, for instance, in which different numbers turn out to be the same, for instance. Um, you can talk about numbers, m let's say, modulo 7. So when you say modulo 7, it means that you're going to count up to 6, and then 7 becomes 0, and then you continue, and then you sort of keep looping it around. So like, let's say that 2 would be equal to 9 modulo 7. Okay. Mm. Uh, so this is called an equivalence relation. It's more general than the principle of identity. But there are different things that you can somehow identify because they have something um, in common. Like uh, for the topologist, you can see these videos on YouTube. Uh, like a donut, the surface of a donut for the topologist is the same as a coffee mug. Because you can sort of start from the donut and keep deforming it. You're not allowed to tear the space, but if you just bend it here and there, you end up with a coffee mug. So this is an equivalence relation, two different objects that are equivalent from, from the point of view of, of topology. It's an equivalence rela relation. Mm -hmm. so, so mathematics is actually, you know, it's, it's more interesting than just the, the principle of, of identity. Mm -hmm. I think you asked a similar question, right? Yes. And it's very active today, and it's full of surprises. Theorems are being proven every day, and it's a very active uh, discipline. Um, and over here, I mean, it's a good question, what, what is infinity? For the mathematicians, infinity is easy to define. It's just something that is not finite. It's by negation, okay? So finite is something that you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence with, say, one, two, three, four, n, then you stop at n, so it's a finite set. If you can't do that, then it's infinite. And uh, you mentioned uh, Cantor. Uh, it's actually a very good question, but for the non mathematicians, uh, Cantor discovered that there are actually uh, infinities that are bigger than other infinities. You have two sets that are both infinite, but you can't do a one to one correspondence in some sense. So you can put one into the other, but not the other into the one. So in some sense, this infinity is bigger. Uh, it was a, was a very surprising uh, discovery at the time. And I think that some mathematicians, I mean, it's a minority, but they would say that they don't, they don't believe in that because somehow you're playing with infinity. It's like trying, you know, uh, something that we shouldn't do. I mean, they believe in finite numbers and I mean, they're called constructivists. <coughs> they believe in things that you can construct. And there's a school of mathematics uh, <coughs> with that kind of idea. But the majority of mathematicians would say that they believe in country sets because they're just you know, too beautiful. I mean, if you don't believe in them, you're losing a lot of interesting uh, mathematics that uh, this, this world of infinities that come to uh, discover. So it's a good question. And you also mentioned, uh, I guess, over here, imaginary numbers. Uh, you, st you started talking about imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers, I mean, they were discovered in mathematics for purely theoretical reasons. I mean, people were trying to solve the cubic equation. I mean, we know how to solve the quadratic equation, but how do we solve the cubic equation? And they realized that putting this number called i somehow made things work. Many, many centuries later, quantum physics, the imaginary numbers turned out to be, to be crucial. So that's how, I mean, it's very interesting how somehow mathematics can sometimes be full. Natural sciences. That's great. Mm -hmm.
This one is, so we're, we're getting some approximations with these multiple infinities here, I feel, <laughs> right? I think, it, I think we're getting some, I don't know what the technical or mathematical term is, but we are getting some approximations here, approximations, plurals. Yes. Um, okay, yes. so the why did they have a, a term for infinity? Because I was in the classroom and the, the teacher asked the students, how do you say infinity in your language? And I, I was lucky enough to, to understand what in language, and they say, oh, they, they talk to each, with each other and then say, oh, something that you go, you go, you go, and you never get to the end. So the end is the, the woman who has no end, uh, the, the tail. You never get to the tail. That's the, how they define it in classroom, because they do not work with this idea, I think, uh, not, you know, uh, during their daily lives. And I, can I mix the questions? Absolutely. Because now, now I just You'll got... Mix uh, and then get some wine, and then we'll mix even more. Oh, my God. Do not ask me anything on wine. Because <laughs> and, that, and then um, I think that one, one thing that I would like to say is that you, you said that you do not agree with Nuremberg's uh, critic. I have nothing to say about it, because I, I do not understand anything about set theory. But I was, you know, I had this problem, as, you, I, as I told you, that I have Wadi in classrooms. So the mathematics I'm talking about is not uh, the mathematics you were talking about, you know, when you're working, I suppose, but the mathematics in the classrooms, which is incredibly poor, very poor, considering, I think, what mathematics could be. So it's about, uh, you know, closed sets and, and zero from, from 10, they do not, this is classrooms, this is, you know, low-level, um, you know, classrooms. So uh, usually teachers that do not find jobs in different places, and um, not the university teachers, but teachers that go to the village or something, they are people who, uh, who and they do not have resources. As they already say, we don't have a data show here. How could we learn Portuguese or mathematics or anything without mm -hmm. equipment? Because equipment is our magic. That's why we learn. Mm -hmm. We learn very fast. Mm -hmm. So, and the Nirenberg just jumped into my, 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 w w to me, because of a friend who is from artificial intelligence, something completely different, and he sent me. And when I got the Nirenberg, oh God, I can put the word of a mathematician in my paper because I cannot talk as a mathematician, but there is one mathematician, I don't know, <laughs> you know, what, what kind of mathematician who published in a very good uh, journal, I, I knew. And then he said this, so this fits. That's what we do as anthropologists, don't we? Just, <laughs> you know, sometimes we want to say something and then we just, oh, that person who is a mathematician is saying exactly what I want to. Because what I'm trying, in, in, in coming to your question, I'm trying to make out something, uh, you know, of, of what, what is uh, our experiencing today. So what I'm trying to, to do is that there is some agency in their lives. And I was, because they are Christians, they lost all their rituals. They, they do not make parties. They, 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 are, they are different now. From uh, when I, I met them in 1986, that they were just, that culture, if you could say, were very alive. But I was trying to, to understand, you know, what is of wariness in this life? Uh, nowadays, and it's not easy to to talk about hybridity or uh, or something like that because syncretism or anything because it doesn't work like that, and just doing translations and just working either inside the inside the church or at school where translations are central was the way I could understand where they are acting. So I think that keeping the one, it's not, I, I don't mean that it's conscious, like that they, they decided to keep the one, but it's something like, you know, they got this, this way. So I was talking to the students this afternoon, and I was talking about portals, because I like the idea of portals, because of my favorite author, who is Murakami. And, and, I, and he used a lot the idea of portal, which is not a bridge. A portal, from my point of view, is, is the opposite of a bridge that makes, you know, a, a way. Because through a portal, you go straight to, to, from one word to another. And I think that some Christian translations, like uh, the, to translate to love by 
to not dislike, which is the way the Wadi say, is a, is a kind of portal, a kind of way for them to, uh, reading or talking to God, uh, get pieces of their world inside the church. It's not that they will dance with feathers inside the church like, you know, syncretic things, but they, that true translation, they can move between words without, nobody knows, nobody knows. This is kind of what they are doing. And I think that the number one is not conscious, of course, that they decided, but the number one, you know, acts like a, a kind of portal when they say alone, they are not saying one. They are not saying one. They are saying, this is our way to think about quantities, let's say. This is alone. So I think it's a very meaningful. And even the missionary who is a linguistic, who worked, wrote a book with Daniel Everett, who is Barbara Kern, uh, they, in their grammar, uh, they say that the Wari do not say one, that they say alone. So I, I have this, this strong basis. And I have several, I think it's time, isn't it? So it's gender, there's so many things that we can talk afterwards, but, but I don't know, can I still? Aparecida, you gave us so much, mm -hmm. Fernando. You gave us a ton to think about too, multiple angles, perspectives, you know. It was really a wonderful, wonderful treat. We thank you all for being here. We want to invite you to continue the conversation, you know, over drinks, right? And then uh, some of the questions were unanswered and that's uh, one more incentive for the conversation to continue. So let's thank Aparecida Vilasa and Fernando Caramacca. Thank you.